the series of messages I've been preaching through is the epistles of John, not just first John. And so today we are going to be in second John, which is a whole 13 verses. And years and years ago, and years and years ago, when my two oldest were little, they memorized this book. Challenge you to memorize this book. It's not that hard. It has a lot of things to say. We're going to cover some of that this morning. I'm going to read it to you together. You're going to listen. I'm going to read <clears throat> the book of Second John. The elder to the elect lady and her children, I love all of you in the truth. And not only I, but also all who have come to know the truth because of the truth that remains in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth in keeping with the command we have received from, your father, from the Father. So now I urge you, dear lady, not as if I were writing you a new commandment, but one we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment you have heard from the beginning. You must walk in love. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves. So you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching, but goes beyond it and does, does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home. And do not say welcome to him. For the one who says welcome to him come, shares in his evil works. Though I have many things to write to you. I do not want to do so with paper and ink. Instead, I hope to be with you and talk face to face, not just Facebook, face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister send you greetings. John, the apostle, is pinning this book. He calls himself the elder. At this point in time in John's ministry, he is the elder statesman. He is the last apostle living. It's quite possible this was written from Patmos, where he had been exiled by the Roman government. Likely he's an 80 or older man. And he pins the things that are on his heart to the elect lady. John pours out in 13 verses what he most desires for this person to know. Now we're going to talk about who she is in a minute. But the most important things that he could put down in pen and ink are what he puts in this little letter. It's full. It's so full of what we need to apply to our life, even this morning. The elect lady, who is she? Well, I believe this is referring to a house church. The word ecclesia, the word in Greek for church, is feminine. We are the bride of Christ, amen? Amen. And so I believe that he is writing metaphorically to a lady, but he's talking about a church in a home that he was familiar with, a specific church. And I believe her children are the members of that church. Who are the children? that he finds walking in truth. 
members that have gone out and are in various places. Through the dispor of the Church of Jerusalem, many, many members left the church they were in and started to migrate out into the greater Roman Empire. And so we, we don't know specifically who or where this church was or who these children, members of the church, were. But we know what John has on his heart. He has two things on his heart, love and truth. Over and over again, if you look at this little book, he says those two words multiple times. He says he loves them in the truth. And he talks about others that love the lady in truth. And then in verse 2, he says it's because of the truth that is in us, that remains in us. And we he talked about remaining in Christ and remaining in truth in the book of 1 John as well. And he says that that truth will be with us forever. We know that the that Jesus said, thy word is true. That the word of God is the ultimate authority and truth. And God himself is truth. Today, truth is under attack. I can have my truth and you can have your truth. But they may not be the same. And the world doesn't see a problem with that. There is no absolutes today. But I have something to tell you. There are absolutes. We find them in the Word of God. Truth is truth. And if you are not in agreement with the Word of God, you're in error. And we need to come to know and understand truth. He greets them in love and truth. And he says that this will abide with us forever. I want to talk about these two words. Really want to be there. Okay. What does love mean? It is the word agape here. It is this selfless, act which we do towards others it is not an emotional word now i know when chris looks into tiffany's eyes he gets all ushy gushy i don't know when she's got that big scar on her knee i'm not sure whether that goes so far anymore what yeah ushy gushy can go away amen anybody ever been upset with somebody that you love and you didn't feel real good about them? Yeah. Love is an action based on a decision to do what is best for the one loved. Yeah, Nana's got it. Doing what is best for the one loved, no matter how you feel. Sometimes parents, dads, doing what is best for your children, they don't like very well. Amen? Discipline is not pleasant for the short time. It is still absolutely love. Truth. I already mentioned that Jesus in John 17, 17 says your word is truth. We're to be sanctified by that truth. The Holy Spirit in John 14, verses 6 and 17, 16 and 17, John Quotes, I quote here, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells in you and will be with you. <clears throat> truth and love are partners. Just like grace and mercy are partners. Truth has no value if it is not coupled with love. I'm going to pick on Beverly because I know she'll love me anyway. That is the ugliest sweater I ever saw. 
that's maybe true. Uh, it's just my opinion. It's not. I don't think that, but I'm picking on it. <laughs> but it certainly isn't loving, huh? Amen? You could be truthful and still be loving in something like that. Sometimes you have to tell somebody hard truth. The Bible says, speak truth and love. It can be difficult to be both truthful and loving, but both are necessary. You know, if you're not very loving, you're probably not going to receive the truth very well, right? Yeah, I like your sweat, by the way. <laughs> Jesus said, John 14, verse 6. If you know it, say it with me. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Is it loving to tell somebody that the path they're on is going to lead to destruction? No, it's not loving to just tell them that because you've just left them in a, in a, in a quagmire that man, I'm, I, I'm going to be destroyed. What, what they need the answer to what do I do? Amen. The loving comes from, but God has provided an answer. God has provided a way out. He's provided salvation through Jesus Christ, his son. Yes, what you're doing, the path you're on right now without a savior leads to destruction, but God. That's where grace and mercy come in. He, he says then in verse three, grace and mercy and peace will be with us from God the Father. I love this verse. Grace. Receiving what you can never earn, what you don't deserve. Mercy, being forgiven and not receiving the penalty that you do owe, the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Mercy says you don't have to die. Grace says I give you eternal life. Where's peace come in? Peace. We're not talking about, oh, I feel really at peace right now. Just, just comforting. No. This is the peace that comes at the end of a long war. The Bible says you in your unsaved state are at enmity with God. Enemies of God. At war with God. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and those that don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior are at war with God the Father. What brings peace? Grace and mercy. Bring peace. And so John here says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. Future tense indicative. Do you remember your Greek? What's the indicative? A statement of fact. It's not a supposition. It's not it might be. Or if you hang on long enough and are good enough, you might get there. No, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, those of you that are his children, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. Future indicative, it is a fact. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. And he qualifies it. This comes, this is ours in truth, reality. God's truth. And love, agape. It comes out of God's love for us, amen? For God so loved the world that he gave. Action. Do you see it? 
Love is always results in action. God loved and he gave his son. Why? So that you might be able to be forgiven mercy and receive grace so that you will have peace with God for all of eternity. And you're a part of his family. No longer hostilities. I was very glad. I was overwhelmingly joyful, John says, to find some of your children walking in truth. There is no greater heartbreak for a pastor than to watch people he has discipled and poured his life into walk away from God. There is no greater sadness. Pastors weep on a regular basis. You have no idea. Talk to men of God that have watched people self-destruct, walk away, But then to watch your members walk with God. Pastor Shemp is in the front row. Pastor Shemp had a ministry for over 50 years at Litchfield Baptist Church. And I can name names of person after person after person who went out from that church walking with God, ministering in multiple places. Let me tell you about one. The year was 1986, and the phone rang in our dining room. And I picked up the phone, and on the other end was a deep-voiced man who said, My name is Philip Muller. I'm calling for Pastor Heinrich. I'm calling from Ceres, California. Is he there? I had no idea who Philip Muller was, but I knew my daddy was up to something. Why is somebody calling from a church in California, we lived in Indiana. Well, unknown to me, my daddy had been out there and he had spoken at this church with the potential of moving our family to California from Indiana back home to pastor a church in California where he'd be near his family and where he would be able to care for his farm that he owned there in Modesto. Dad hung up the phone and I sat there and listened to the whole conversation. He hung up the phone and I said, what is going on? Well, daddy hadn't told me about it because he knew my reputation and I had earned it. That I had a big mouth. And if he had told me about it, everybody in the church would have known what was going on. We moved to Ceres the summer of 1986 and got to know the Moeller family. Philip and Becky and their children, Titus and Timothy and Sherry, their adopted daughter. I started to go to Cedarville College and I met this gorgeous young lady from Litchfield, Ohio. And we started to date and we got engaged and lo and behold, would you believe it? But that was the church Philip Muller had grown up in, was her church. And that her pastor was David Shemp. And here he was, a chemist, working for the Nestle plant in Ripon, California. Ministering as chairman of the deacons at First Baptist Church of Ceres, having grown up under the ministry of David Shemp. Does that give you goosebumps? Isn't that cool? One example of finding the members of a local church that had grown up in the Word of God under the teaching and ministry of the Shemps. Serving God. What a tremendous joy for mom and dad to have as they watch Phil and his family serve God to this day. Becky passed away a number of years ago from cancer. But not only Phil... But Timothy and Titus and Sherry all serving God. No greater joy. 
then to see how God works. I love talking to Todd and Shelley Step. I love talking to, um, I just lost their names, that are there with them. Kathy. Kathy, Peyton and Kathy, who were just here for a short time, but are serving at Charity Baptist Church there in New Mexico. And seeing how God continues to use them for his glory. There is no greater joy. And there is no greater sadness than to watch someone who has walked away and is no longer serving God. I was speaking to uh, one of the officers at the Tracy PD who still counts himself a Christian but is no longer attending church. This is where God wants us to be. Being part of the family, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, Hebrews. We gather together for a purpose of worship and discipleship and jointly to reach out into this community. That's why we have church. I'm glad we have Facebook. And for those of you that are on Facebook, I hope you're, you're able to hear it. I'm, I realize we were having some problems earlier. But it's only when you can't be here that we want you to do that. Carmel is not with us. And her daughter, Tina, said she was going to go to the hospital and take, a, take a, a phone or an iPad and tune in. Praise God we can do that. Amen? I'm so thankful that we have that opportunity. But when we can, we should be here. He gives a warning, instruction first, then a warning. It says, first of all, love one another. He begs them. He says in verse 5, um, says, I urge you. The idea in the Greek is I beg you. John was known in history of being brought into churches, in, uh, being carried in a chair, and he would sit down as an old 90-plus-year-old man. He was the oldest living apostle, oldest apostle, live, live longer than anybody else. And he would just say, love one another. The greatest thing you can do, John is emphasizing, is love one another. I urge you, church, to do what you've known to do from the beginning. Love each other. How easy is it to have hard feelings? And let those hard feelings get in the way of doing good things, doing right things, of being a blessing. How easy is it, church, to develop bitterness in our hearts? Remember, yeah, how, many, how many of you know the phrase, look, j j follow your heart, follow your heart. You know that phrase? It's a lie. Do not follow your heart. Your heart will lead you astray. Follow the word of God. When it says to love each other, it doesn't mean love the people you like. <laughs> love the people that haven't rubbed you wrong. Love the people that love you back. No, it says love each other unconditionally. That means your love without expecting anything in return. Love each other. And love is definition? Doing what's best for the one loved. Doing what's best. Not what's best for you. Doing what's best for the one loved. Love each other. This is love, that we keep his commandments. He says, and this is love, verse 6, that we walk according to his commandments. Matthew 28. Go 
therefore, or more appropriately, as you are going, do what? Make disciples. We're going to do a lot more disciple making at Crossroads in the next few years. That's going to become much more of our heartbeat than it's ever been before. As you are going, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, no, teaching them to observe, obey everything that I've commanded you. Dads, since this is a Father's Day message, how many of you just want your kids to know what's right and you don't really care whether they do what's right? I don't see a single hand going up. When you teach your children to what is right and what is wrong, you're teaching them to do what is right and not do what is wrong. Amen? Yeah. Jesus said, make disciples with the purpose of teaching them to be obedient followers of Christ. This is love. That you walk. Ideas obey. No, I didn't put it up there. The ideas obey. That you walk according to his commands. Love one another by doing what Christ has told you to do. When he says he was excited, joyful to find children walking in the truth, he had instilled in them, he had taught them, he had discipled them to do what was right. And now, lo and behold, he finds them doing what's right. And that excited him. Spent 24 years. Starting started 24 years ago, next week, teaching my children. Started with one, by the way. She's sitting right back there. Teaching my children what's right from the Word of God. And every time she would reach for the hot stove, I would smack her hand. Anybody else? And when she did something I told her not to do, or she told me no, and I said yes, I smacked her bottom for the whole purpose of coming to the day when the decision she makes is based on what's right and what's wrong, and she makes the decisions to do what's right. And when your children come to that point, what's that? Say it loud enough, I can hear it. <clears throat> just a second. Hang on, you're, you're talking too fast, too, too quick. And there, you, you have no greater joy than finding your children doing exactly that. I have never been more proud and more joyful with my children than I am now. Now, my youngest is 16. She should have it figured out by now. And I rarely have to correct her. My oldest, I now only give advice. <laughs> and we, although we all mess up sometimes, even in adulthood, I trust that she's making decisions based on knowing what's right. And she's desiring and purposing in her heart to do what's right. That's what I see. And I tell you what, just one happy daddy. Of course, if she could sing like a lift <laughs> oh. My kids, I love them. All right, let's get on to the warning and I'll be done. says, be careful. Be careful, Christians. Because there's a lot of people out there that want to deceive you. There's a lot of people out there that are pretending that they are teaching the truth, but he calls them deceivers. 
we want to think, at least I do, this is my personality. I want to think best of people. I always want to think best of people. My wife is more discerning than me. And sometimes she has to draw me back in and say, Tim, you really know, you know that they're really, that's not really what they are, that they're deceiving. And I have to go, oh man, I, you know, I'm so glad God gave her to me because I don't always see it. So John here says, open your eyes and be careful. Set a guard over who is teaching you. Be careful to analyze because many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. They do not hold the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ having come together in the what we call in theology the hypostatic union. The incarnation. What does incarnation mean again? God got in the car and went to the nation. Incarnation. It talks about God coming in the flesh. And I'm just giving you the clues to be able to remember these things. Be careful. They're deceivers. And they're antichrists. And multiple times I give have given the illustration of what a deceiver really is. It's I shock people sometimes saying I like to be a deceiver, and I do. You ever wanted to deceive somebody? I, I don't want to deceive people. I want to deceive mice. I don't like mice. I don't want them in my house. And I want to deceive them into thinking that the food I'm giving them is good for them. And so in order to make that, to accomplish that, I buy food that is 99% good and 1% arsenic. And the mouse smells that and he does not smell the arsenic. He's not named... What's, what's Ratatouille, the Ratatouille guy's named? I forget. Remy. Remy. He's not named Remy. He can't smell the poison. Thank you for knowing that, Janae. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> He's not Remy. I love that movie, by the way. And he eats it and he dies. Christians, Satan does the same thing. He puts out teachers that sound good. And you don't have any red flags going up saying, wait a second. That's wrong. You need to learn all you can about Scripture so that you know when somebody is not teaching truth. Satan, the great deceiver. And he uses that. So what's he say? Look out. Watch out. Look in. Watch for yourselves that you don't lose. Following them will cause you to lose what you've worked for. Look out. Look in. They deny Christ. They're antichrist. There's a danger of first going back to childhood. Look out so you don't lose what you've worked for. Don't go backwards into Judaism. There's a danger of going ahead, running too far. If anyone does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it, does not have God, don't go beyond what Scripture says. How many people have added to the Word of God over the years all the man's rules and man's regulations and all these things because they think that's what's going to please God? Wait, stay within Scripture. Look in so you don't go too far. Don't trespass. And then finally... The danger of going along. He says, the one who remains in that teaching, this one, uh, excuse me, um, going beyond. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home. Now remember, who's he talking to? A church that meets where? In a home. Here comes a teacher. Oh, I'm a, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist, and I, I want to come, and, and I'd like to hold some meetings. I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I'm certainly not going to let you come in and teach my people until I do. And I know what you believe because there's a danger of going along with people. And then he says, don't say welcome or Godspeed or God bless. Have you ever have the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door? 
a lot of people apply this that you can't let them in your house. I don't know that that's really the case, although I don't. I don't bring them in because I don't want them teaching me. I stand on the door and I teach them. I don't say, well, you tell me your spill and then I'll tell you mine. No, I don't do that. Because they're poison. I'll say that publicly. And there are other cults like them that are poison. <clears throat> I don't mind teaching them. I don't mind sharing the word of God with them. They're not going to teach me. And when they leave, I don't say, have a great day. I don't want them to have a great day. Or God bless. I don't want God's blessing on their life. That's what he's talking about. You don't send them off with your blessings. Somebody comes who is a deceiver. You don't bring them in. And you don't send them out with your blessings. It's that serious. Why? Because we are careful about the authoritative, inspired, inerrant word of God and how it's taught. There's danger. And if you, I had a roommate in college. <laughs> he actually lives in Roanoke, Virginia, where I was this week. Couldn't get a hold of him. Tried to. But he was like a sailboat without a rudder. He was blown first this way and then that, that way with every wind of doctrine that came along and every deceiver of it that caught his ear. And as far as I know today, he isn't serving God at all. I'll tell you, I loved Paul Morgan, who was my roommate in college. He and I were good friends. And it breaks my heart, even though I was never his pastor, to not see him walking with God. There's great joy in seeing the children of the, 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 the people that have come through a church walking with God. And there's great heartache when they don't. When they follow the deceivers, when, when, when they don't watch out. They slip back into the elementary principles or they go too far into legalism or they just simply lose their faith. We need to rededicate ourselves to loving one another. We need to rededicate ourselves to knowing truth. We need to rededicate ourselves to the discipleship and learning of God's word. So that when a deceiver comes to our door, or maybe you're visiting a church, you will know beyond any doubt that I this is not somebody I should listen to. I've known people that have gone into churches and got up and walked out. I have never had to do that, but I would. If someone was preaching heresy, I would gather my family together and we'd walk out. It's that important. Walk like your father. That's what I instructed this, in, 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 entitled this message. Walk like dad, our heavenly father. I have the privilege of being able to walk like my earthly father too. Some of you do as well. Some of you don't. But if you can, if your father loved the Lord and knew the Lord, emulate him too. But you, But more importantly, Paul said, follow me as... I follow Christ. Remember, he's the leader. He's the one we need to be looking for. He's the one we need to be following. John here, the elder, looking at this lady and her children as, as someone that he loved, that he wanted to see walking with God. Great joy. But also a desire to protect. That sounds like a daddy, doesn't it? Desire to protect his kids. Watch out. Be careful. Know the truth. Love each other. That's what God wants. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us the truth. Your word is truth. That we can love each other unconditionally, unemotionally, we don't follow our hearts, we follow your word. 
for our hearts will deceive us. Help us, Father, to love each other in a greater way. Help us to love you more. Help us desire and take the time and energy that it takes to be your disciple. In Jesus' name, amen.